Hello, everybody. Welcome to Libraries That Learn, Using Evidence to Transform Library Services. This is um, a webcast uh, that uh, will feature uh, how LiveCall has been used at uh, Texas A&M University. And uh, this is uh, part of a series of webcasts. Uh, we have, uh, this is the second one. The first one has already been taped and it's available on the ARL YouTube channel. And it was with Selena Kilik from Cranfield University. Uh, in this one, we have Michael Maciel from Texas A&M University. This is the institution where uh, LiveCall was uh, created many, many years ago. Um, and um, the next one, the May 5th one, is going to feature Lori Clauda uh, from McGill University, uh, the, one of the key people who developed LiveCall uh, was Colleen Cook, who was uh, AUL at Texas A&M University when she originally developed uh, uh, LiveCall, and then uh, she became the Dean of Libraries there, and uh, uh, more recently now she's the Dean of Libraries at McGill University. Um, so there is a little bit of a link uh, between these um, two institutions there. Uh, but uh, Michael Maciel is uh, here to tell us about uh, the way LiveCall is used at Texas A&M University. Michael, the floor is yours. Hello? Hello, Michael. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Does that mean everyone else can hear me too? Yes. The floor is yours. Go All ahead. Right. All right. Well, thank you everyone for taking time out today to uh, uh, listen to me speak about Live Call at the Texas A&M University Libraries. The, uh, the title of this presentation is Libraries That Learn and uh, Using Evidence to Transform Library Services. But I do want to start out by talking a little bit about um, what uh, the assessment person, in this case myself, has learned over the years. And um, primarily I have three goals uh, to talk about today. And the first of that is to talk about how I go about presenting the live call findings to the libraries and also to our library users. Um, I've learned over the years that to be successful in this you have to uh, learn to speak the language of your audiences. Uh, if your audience is more interested in uh, expenditures, then that's where you need to begin the conversation. If your uh, audience is more interested in collections, you know, once again, that's, that's where you're going to begin this, uh, this discourse of uh, what LiveQual has revealed to the libraries, to its users, and what, what we plan to do with that information. Um, and last, what I've learned is that um, over years and years of just rushing to get out all the live qual data from a completed survey at one time, I've learned that the better approach is to uh, parse out the live qual findings uh, by section, and um, we'll talk about the various sections that I've developed over the years, but uh, develop and, and deliver those uh, findings by section over the course of time and not just in one large sum. It uh, generates interest, and it also keeps live call at the uh, uh, forefront of uh, what people are thinking about when they are talking about user needs and how to identify those and meet those. A little bit about uh, before we begin, I want to talk about what uh, 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 about the university itself. We are a Lansing and Grant University. Uh, they, as of 2013-14, we had over 62,000 students with uh, 3,200 full-time instructional faculty. The library itself is composed of 14 different libraries. Uh, these are located uh, mainly throughout the state of Texas. We do have a library located in Qatar uh, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, we possess uh, over 5.2 million volumes. Uh, as a matter of fact, we just got through celebrating the edition of our official 5 millionth volume, which was a first edition of The Hobbit. Uh, we have 121,000 unique serial titles, 94% of which are available in electronic format, and 93 librarians. When I go about looking at the LiveQual core questions, what I've done is actually split them into 
um, smaller bite-sized pieces that people can understand. Within Effective Service, there's nine questions, five which uh, address customer treatment, four which talk about the job expertise of our librarians and the people that uh, serve our users. Information controls uh, broken into the resources themselves, whether print, electronic, or the distinction of being a journal. Uh, and the five questions of the eight of information control address uh, accessibility of that information. Uh, what are we doing as a library to provide access to this, uh, these resources that we collect in a, in a format and in a delivery method that um, our users are comfortable with using and that is in many cases very self-intuitive uh, to them to use. Uh, third, within library's place, uh, there's three questions I think deal with the library environment as a whole, while one question uh, addresses individual study and another question uh, addresses community space. Uh, if you can see from the slide how I've broken these out. Uh, so, um, first of all, at Midwinter ALA, uh, what Martha and myself presented was setting up, uh, registering for, setting up, and starting the survey. So for those of you that are interested in that, um, I believe that the uh, um, slides and presentation um, that was presented at ALA Midwinter and that will probably be, be presented at a ALA coming up um, can help you with that part of the process. But uh, just keep in mind that where I'm going from this point is as if you've already registered and set up your survey and you just hit the button to um, um, begin the survey. Uh, one of the first things I look at is, um, or I do while the survey is running, is I do look at the summaries page. Um, I've included a, a snapshot of some of the graphs that are presented on the by user group of the um, data repository um, um, survey page that is um, that is is on LiveCall. I particularly look at the discipline survey, and I look at the uh, survey by position or by user group. Um, what I'm looking for in particular within the discipline is to see if there's areas where our marketing efforts uh, have not uh, penetrated um, as well as we would have liked. Uh, for example, I, I'll go down to nursing. What I'm looking at more is that 21 uh, rather than that 0.64%. And in particular, I know that's 21 out of a total population of 63. So we're actually reaching about a we're actually um, obtaining about a 33% response rate. Uh, so even though that number looks low and looks uh, uh, less impactful on this graph, the, what that 21 is to over to the total population tells me we're doing a pretty good job. On the other hand, uh, I can look at dentistry and tell you that that 28 is uh, not as uh, uh, representative of the population. And in cases like that, what I'll do is I'll contact our subject librarian and uh, mid-survey talk about other ways that we can market the survey to that particular group. I also want to point out that there's an other undecided category, and if that number gets too large, again, it makes me wonder about who these individuals are that aren't identifying colleges and uh, um, Generally, in those cases, I'll start going to the comments to see if I can figure out uh, if there's a user group that uh, we've uh, mislabeled or a user group that we just haven't rep re represented in, in the survey. And the same thing can be said for uh, the, the user groups themselves, undergraduate, graduate, and faculty. Uh, it's no surprise that undergraduates represent the largest of that. But again, looking at those numbers in relation to what the total population is by user group tells me about where we're successful and where we need to kind of amp up the, uh, the marketing of our um, survey to get a better response rate. Um, Martha, any comments or questions at this point? Now this is it. Uh, Michael, what, uh, okay, I was going to ask you what year it is. I see on the slide it's 2013. Uh, this is good. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is correct. Now, um, when I start presenting results, what happened was we ran part of the survey in 2013 and we ran the survey again in 2014 for some user groups that we had missed. Um, our Health Science Center had just merged with the uh, university and as a result, uh, we weren't able to get an accurate list of email addresses until 2014 to uh, 
you know, specifically invite uh, people from um, that center to participate. So as I start presenting the data, it may say 2012, 2013, but in fact it represents uh, two surveys combined over the course of 2012 through 2014. Okay, so next slide is, uh, as I mentioned, while the surveys is is going on, uh, what I, I do is I, I typically start reviewing the, the comments and start begin, and begin coding them. A lot of times as the comments come in, you'll see trends that you can begin discussions with various people within the library on, but also you'll be able to see um, issues arising. Um, for example, uh, a user may comment on a specific journal title that they're saying that um, we, don't have as, uh, we don't have as a resource. And it's been um, it's it's just been my observation over the course of the years is that when we do have that happen, more often than not we do have a subscription to that journal. And what the problem is is that we've neglected to put in uh, alternative titles uh, that uh, enable our users to um, better access and better uh, discover those uh, journal titles when they're searching. Uh, it's, it's a really bad example, but I use JAMA. Uh, a lot of people still look for that under journal, journal of American Medicine. And as a result of that, if we don't have that 246 line in there, um, they're unaware of the fact that we do keep a current subscription with that uh, resource. Um, as I get the comments, I, I do begin distributing them. I don't wait till the end of the survey to do that. Uh, again, part of this is just to make sure that people stay involved in the live call survey process as it's going on as opposed to um, after it's a done deed. Um, I will send out uh, comments, uh, particularly significant comments that may address a particular user group, uh, a discipline, or a library. We often find that uh, comments that address specific libraries um, have to do with not only the library's place uh, uh, feature within uh, live call, but also address some of the needs of that particular campus. Uh, we do have several libraries that lo are located on campuses that uh, uh, address a specific uh, discipline. For example, we have a Kingsville library that primarily addresses uh, pharmacy uh, research and resources. So um, I look for those comments coming out of Kingsville and uh, do forward those to the Kingsville librarian um, and as well as the pharmacy subject librarian to review. Um, I um, send out uh, library department um, uh, comments by library department, library functions, for example, our ILL department, as well as uh, begin uh, the coding process for the various live call categories, uh, information control, library's place, and effective service. Uh, the one thing that's not on this list is I also, if a specific person or a specific department is mentioned, I make sure that I forward those comments not only to the uh, person that, or group being addressed, but also to their supervisor as well as to our dean, just to make sure that those kudos that come from our users are being recognized. Um, now, as uh, I mentioned, um, I do break up the um, live call comments into, into the uh, core questions three categories, uh, with the exception that I've actually broken out the information control into two separate. Uh, these are effective service, information uh, control has been broken into the resources and information resources as well as information accessibility. Uh, in my mind, those are sometimes two separate issues. And then uh, fourth, library's place. Um, you can see under each of these I've uh, assigned um, additional codes or subcodes uh, for particular areas that we're interested in. For effective service, uh, any comments to deal with job expertise or our marketing efforts, um, library in place, uh, library's place, uh, uh, we do look at food. It's become actually a, uh, an important uh, feature or factor when discussing the library's place. So I look to see if there's any comments, whether it's, you know, great, you know, um, great vending machines you have, or if it's something like, gee, the library's beginning to look a little dirty with all the food wrappers around. And uh, again, within information resources, um, the hot button these days particularly is textbooks and you know what uh, the library does to provide access to them. So I, I keep a special eye out for that. There is a question uh, that came through um, when you mentioned uh, that you forward the compliments 
to uh, the people who who receive um, complimentary mentions in uh-huh. the comments. Um, someone is wondering, uh, Leona Jacobs is wondering, what do you do with the negative uh, feedback you may be getting? Uh, well, uh, typically what I'll do is I'm going to route those uh, pri- primarily to our associate deans. And the reason for that is, um, uh, th- you know, those are very sensitive comments. And um, one, we may decide not to include them. Uh, when we we do present all the comments out to the entire library to review, uh, but we may not include those type comments. And the other thing is, you know, wh- what do we do about this issue? Is it necessarily uh, the employee that is, you know, at fault here, or is this an issue that, you know, we particularly drop the ball and, you know, the consistency of the customer treatment training that we want to provide? And that's become a real issue because A&M is in that transition of, changing our customer service model. Uh, but those comments get directed to the associate dean first. Um, in one case, um, it's, and again, it's um, just kind of an unusual circumstance, but in one case, the individual that was uh, mentioned was retiring that year. So uh, we just opted not, you know, not to do anything about that comment at that level, at, you know, to that person, but uh, just, you know, Make sure we reemphasize you know, the, the, that particular point of customer service to the entire group. Yeah, this is actually an, an uh, interesting practice because Leona also followed up and says that uh, she her, uh, herself depersonalizes the comments, uh, so the focus is on the uh, customer service issue and not to and not on the person. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Well, yes, and and uh, Leona, that's that's actually an excellent point. Uh, where we can, uh, where I can, or where we can. Uh, we do that too because there may be a bigger point than just that that individual person that needs to be addressed. Now, one thing that I want to point out that when you do a uh, comments analysis is um, using the broad, um, you know, core question categories. You you really don't see any surprises in you know what our user groups consider priorities. If you look at uh, the undergraduate comments, 60% of them addressed uh, the library's place. We expect that. Um, graduates, uh, 30% addressed libraries place, 35% addressed information accessibility, uh, and then uh, another 17% addressed information resources. Uh, again, the expectation there is that uh, you know graduate students are going to be using the library as a place of study as well. Uh, it's been my experience that we have to be very sensitive to this as a user group because they're not looking for the uh, the group uh, facilities that we offered undergraduates. They really want to see those, you know, quiet individual study spaces available. And information accessibility is, is a big issue both with graduates and undergraduates, but kind of more of a, uh, a hot button with graduates in that they want to be able to discover materials on their own. So this uh, chart representing that 35% of comments addressed information accessibility from graduates again tells us something that we sort of already expected, which, you know, self-discovery is a very important part of the um, uh, library service that we need to offer to our graduates, uh, which, if you move on to faculty, again, is something that we do know already, that information accessibility for faculty is important, as well as the information resources themselves. What's interesting about this, and you'll see this also borne out on the um, live call core questions, is that treatment uh, for uh, how we treat faculty is very important. And to be very specific, it's being able to demonstrate to our faculty that we're able to speak to them about their subject in an intelligent fashion. It's, uh, we really do kind of have to prove to our faculty more than any other user group that uh, you know, we speak their language, we understand their research and what they're focusing on. So again, uh, going back to the slide about the comments and how I, I provide uh, subcodes, where you may find you know, self-evident uh, discoveries within the comments. It's when you really start to break down the comments um, into these smaller groups is where you get some pretty important revelations. Um, one thing that uh, uh, we found out over the course of time was that we thought we had set a very uh, um, uh, reasonable uh, policy uh, on fines, and in fact, that the the small changes that we thought you know were were good changes uh, turned out uh, not to be well uh, received by our user groups, and we had to go back and revisit that issue. 
So um, the, the devil really is in the details when it comes to looking at comments. Uh, you can definitely categorize them by the larger groups, but uh, here's a chance for you to uh, really sit down and look at each comment and see if it's telling you something that uh, either confirms a suspicion or introduces a new line of thought into uh, you know, how you perceive user needs. Um, one of the first things I do after the survey is, uh, again, um, as the survey is being conducted, I'll do the comments analysis. Uh, one of the first uh, presentations that I do once the survey is uh, closed is I do a presentation on comments. Um, after that, the next um, uh, review I do is what I call the top five list, is where I, li I look by user group, um, what are the top five um, uh, pr uh, desired scores, which I translate to mean priorities. What are the top five, again, by user group uh, successes, which are perceptions? And then I address the areas where we're falling short of meeting user needs. And um, I use uh, a review of the adequ adequacy gap within the, um, the live, live call um, zone of tolerance. Uh, and it's a ratio that I use that um, um, turns this into percentage, which basically says, you know, where is your perception located within that zone of tolerance? The closer your your perception is to uh, the minimal score, we consider that uh, a concern. And the closer your uh, perceived score is to the desired score, we consider that a success. But you can see here that you can do uh, two different types of reviews. Um, one of them is, let me see if I can get the marker to work here. One of them is I will look by user group across the board about what the priorities, successes, and concerns are. You'll see that from the priorities, the, the biggest, again, no surprise, the biggest priority is going to be the library space component. Um, what surprised us this last year was that quiet space was uh, very important to um, undergraduates. Uh, in previous years, that hadn't been the case. It was group space. But uh, this caused us um, uh, to reevaluate what our needs were for um, uh, space redesign. We're currently going through uh, a Reimagine the Libraries project. Where I think we're on the third phase now and looking at our upper floor study areas that historically have been um, group study areas that we're now becoming a, a little bit more particular in terms of defining uh, quiet space areas as well as uh, group study areas. Um, we fortunately have a great model for that. And um, I believe Leslie Reynolds is part of this discussion, but Leslie uh, many years ago, used to be the head of our West Campus Libraries, uh, which was uh, de facto, you know, social center of the campus for many years. It, it quickly reached capacity each and every single night. So we had to address um, both group study needs, which the associated uh, noise that comes out of putting a whole bunch of people in a large room, as well as finding and defining areas where um, we could provide quiet space, but also in an area that where the groups themselves discipline themselves to um, maintain that quiet area. And uh, if you look from the concerns, you'll see again that quiet space is a concern and that um, we need it at, at the time of this survey to have done something about that for undergraduates. And in fact, as we're beginning our uh, renovation, um, we are including a lot more uh, quiet space areas. If you look at our successes, what's really nice about this is that they all talk about customer treatment and customer care, job knowledge. Um, but um, once you start looking into more of the details, you find that these successes are also matched by the fact that many of our undergraduates just don't want help. They really want a, a universe where they can discover materials on their own, be able to research materials on their own. So part of being able to be a success in customer service is understanding is that when these undergraduates do come to us, they're uh, they're coming to us very frustrated. They've already tried stuff on their own, and not only do we need to be able to meet their research needs, but we also need to be able to understand their tone and their, their well, for lack of a better word, mood when they approach us. Uh, we need a little bit of resilience training, if you will, and uh, what we've incorporated into our customer training, in fact. Uh, so anyway, one way of looking at this is by the user group themselves. The other is to look at seeing what priorities, successes, or concerns translate across user groups. And again, if you look at priorities, you'll see that library space for undergraduates was a big priority. Uh, information 
access and information resources was a big issue for graduates as well as for faculty. But I do want to point out here, and this is where we talk, I talked earlier about the fact that with faculty we found that the ability or at least being able to convince our faculty that we know what they're, what they're speaking about and we do have the skills necessary to understand what they're looking for uh, is, is part of our training matrix. Uh, it's not just enough to say we're a librarian, we can find anything, but we really do have to be able to speak their language in, either, in order to help their needs. Um, questions so far? We doing good, Martha? Yeah, I think we're doing good. I okay. don't see people, uh, feel free to type your questions. And yeah, let's move on. All right. So um, after I've done the comments analysis presentation and I've done the top five presentation, the next thing I start looking at is I start looking at comments by, um, um, by, by trend. Uh, in this case, you'll see that what I did is I picked the printed library materials I need for work um, uh, information control question, and I've tracked that from 2001 through 2012. Um, now, I'm, unfortunately, this is one of those charts that has maybe a little too much to look at out at once. So for right now, what I'm going to ask is that you ignore the ARL desired scores and the ARL perceived scores and just look at my, my blocks here, which are your zones of tolerance, and then my diamonds, which are the perceived scores. And you can see over the course of the year that for our faculty, um, the perceived scores have risen to the point that in 2012, not only were we scoring very high uh, with regard to the perception of the library print materials that we provide, but in the cases of our faculty, we actually exceeded their needs. They, uh, the faculty were beginning to uh, reach that point where um, format wasn't important or critical as issue as it had been in previous years. I do want to point out um, 2005 for you uh, here because it's just kind of interesting. Uh, this was uh, a year that we made a very concerted effort to move as uh, much of our materials as we could to electronic resources. And as a result of that, where in the previous two years we had uh, we were within the zone of tolerance. Uh, in 2005, we fell out of the zone of tolerance as well as the zone of tolerance um, increasing a bit. And again, this was affected by um, this was the result of us uh, moving more materials to electronic resources and our users uh, reacting to that. But if you look at 2000. Six um, and then you know previous years, uh, skipping 2007, we'll pretend that doesn't exist for right now. But uh, looking at 2006, you can see we begin falling within the zone of tolerance, and over the course of the years, uh, we steadily increased as um, the priority of, of um, print materials um, uh, decreased. Uh, so that is the trend analysis that I'm doing. The benchmarking analysis I do is. I do um, like to time to time compare ourselves to ARL just to see, you know, um, are we consistent with the trend or is, you know, is, uh, is there a trend out there where we need to be doing something different and there's evidence to indicate that there's libraries out there that are doing it better than us. Uh, if you look at the perceived scores, you'll see that over the course of time, uh, ARL scores have also increased, uh, not as much, but keep in mind that may just be a factor, the fact that we're averaging scores here as opposed to um, looking at a particular institution. And desired scores, again, are doing the same thing that's happening in Texas A&M. They started out high and are slowly decreasing. As, as our population gets used to um, the fact that more and more information is going to be delivered to them in electronic uh, format. Uh, one of the biggest hurdles that we're facing right now is that um, we've accomplished the print journal to e-journal transition, and we're now currently working on the print book to uh, e-book model, and uh, uh, many of our professors uh, in particular are uh, you know, having to go through the uh, a, 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 a transition process themselves and getting used to that change in format. So um, uh, again, I will also look at uh, questions by department or by college to see if there's a particular need where we um, need to address a particular college's uh, uh, concerns. And you can see that uh, desired scores vary depending upon department for electronic resources. 
Um, the good news is that in all cases, we are within the zone of tolerance. Uh, the um, issue that raises concerns is that some colleges, for example, liberal arts, while we are in the zone of tolerance, we're not particularly in the higher part of that zone of tolerance. You can see we're um, the lower 50 percent of the zone, zone of tolerance here. And so the question goes out, you know, exactly, you know, what's going on with the liberal arts and uh, why they don't feel we're as successfully meeting their electronic resource needs as we are with other colleges. And um, I guess this is a good time to point out that one thing that LiveCall does is uh, LiveCall will present answers for you, but in uh, many cases LiveCall will also uh, identify an issue that needs further research. And in the case of liberal arts, um, what, what we had to do is um, you know, speak specifically to some subject librarians who, in fact, went out there and began having a discussion about, you know, um, what e-resources that you know about um, that are out there that we're not providing and what can we do to improve that. Okay, um, next slide. So um, uh, getting near the end here, we're talking about presentation of survey results. Um, Internal presentations, um, again, the comments analyses that I talked about, internal presentations, the data analyses. Um, at this point, uh, we are, um, even though our funding model has changed slightly, we're still beholding upon the students' blessing uh, for support when it comes to funding for the library. So it's important that we go out uh, in a perfect world annually, sometimes biannually, but we'll go out to the various student governments uh, the undergraduate student government, the graduate council, and definitely the faculty senate, where we'll uh, present um, findings that are germane to their missions. Um, for example, the faculty will certainly talk about what faculty needs are, but to address instructional faculty needs, um, I'll make sure to include uh, some of the findings from uh, both graduates and undergraduates when we uh, present to them. Um, I, I have, upon invitation of subject librarians, uh, given presentations to various colleges. Uh, when you talk about learning the language of the audience, this is probably the uh, worst case scenario because uh, as going in there as an assessment person, uh, you may not have the same dialogue or relationships built that the subject librarian does. So it's important that you partner with your uh, subject librarian when you do present to uh, various colleges on campus. Um, and the big thing, especially now, um, in 2017, uh, Texas A&M is getting ready to go through uh, another uh, reaffirmation of accreditation with, with our uh, regional accrediting agency, which is SACS. And LiveCall has become a very important part, both in our yearly assessment reports that we're preparing for the uh, assessment report in 2017, but also for the uh, particular guidelines and regulations for libraries uh, within our regional uh, reporting group. Um, now we talked a little bit about, you know, what we've um, what we've learned, what I've learned, and um, uh, at the libraries, and I just want to kind of address some specifics as, as in terms of the uh, subtitle here: using evidence to transform library services. What we found with customer treatment um, um, over the years was that it was very inconsistent. Um, we were getting um, very good scores on on the live call core questions themselves. But we found that within our comments, we kept every single year getting those, you know, comments that were, you know, Joe so and so, or the the woman at the service desk was rude to me, and um, uh, we we really couldn't shake those. And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about maybe one or two within a set of you know 200 comments. I'm talking about a, a larger percentage of those comments uh, with uh, with respect to effective service. So we really felt that our issue here was that, you know, one, uh, in many cases we already had um, a good model for how to treat our customers and how to talk to our customers, but that we weren't being very consistent with that training. Um, so I, I want to say about five years ago we went out and enlisted the services of the uh, Disney Leadership Institute and uh, have uh, um, over these years um, developed a customer service model um, that's based upon what we've learned at that institute and in particular on how to deliver a consistent, uh, underline that word consistent, positive, um, another word to underline, customer service uh, interaction. Job expertise um, was uh, another issue and what we found in, in particular for faculty is, and in particular for our subject librarians 
was that uh, it was important that uh, at the very least our subject librarians you know have some understanding of what courses our faculty was teaching or what research and in what fields they were teaching so that they develop that kind of um, bridge between the library and the faculty member specifically in order to uh, initiate um, you know meaningful conversations a little bit of knowledge about who your customer is can go a long way uh, instruction came up um, uh, in addition to the uh, live call questions um, that are, are provided we had also conducted a um, surveys within many of the instructional sessions that were provided and both live call and the surveys from the sessions all indicated that um, uh, we needed a, a, a more consistent approach uh, and over the course of years we uh, broke um, our approach into two perspectives one is is that uh, instead of trying to teach uh, li what library services we offer and what library uh, uh, and what um, lifelong learning skills we could uh, uh, you know provide for our students we broke that into two groups we provide a very substantial open house uh, orientation model for our, our first-year students that's uh, irrespective of whether they're transfer students first-year undergraduate or under or graduate uh, we do provide a similar service for our, our faculty members uh, where we talk just about what the library has to offer it's, it's ours uh, its ability, what equipment is available for checkout, what facilities are available for use within the libraries and, and stuff of that nature. And then later on, especially in the case of undergraduates, uh, uh, more often in their junior and senior year when they're taking many of their um, core requirements and their, uh, their writing specific classes, is where, where we begin the discussion about lifelong learning skills and in information literacy. Um, we um, were very fortunate to hire a very talented person um, out of New York to uh, handle our, our marketing for the libraries and uh, we're delivering a, a more consistent message and uh, when people see uh, that certain icon that represent the libraries you know they they recognize that as an information resource in itself so we've uh, we've learned over the years through our live call findings and in particular our live call comments um, that there was a need and that we've you know as the comments are coming out we're finding that we're being successful in, in meeting that marketing need information control information resources in many cases has sent us delving deeper into uh, issues uh, I talked about the ebook versus print book matter um, one of the um, biggest issues that I have is that I can through circulation statistics measure print uh, transactions and print trends but have been un unable to do that with electronic resources. And uh, I definitely you know, um, want to talk about the success we've had with uh, an ARL um, survey called Minds for Libraries, where it actually helps us identify not only what resources are being used, but by what user groups, faculty, undergraduate, graduate, and also by what uh, colleges and departments. Uh, I would recommend, you know, provided that you have the resources and the time that you look into the Minds for Libraries if you want to get a better understanding of who your uh, uh, electronic resource users are. Uh, information accessibility was also a big concern and, um, that we've addressed over the years uh, in terms of, more than anything else, website design. Uh, as I mentioned at midwinter, um, I don't think we're ever going to get ahead of the curve on um, designing the perfect web uh, site. Uh, technology will always be um, challenging us to keep up. Um, but we have learned things over the years and as a result have been uh, a lot more effective in uh, enabling our users to uh, self-discover resources and uh, services at the library. Uh, finally, um, I talk about uh, the library's place and library environment. Uh, uh, the comments that have come out um, have helped us uh, support arguments for funding for library renovations uh, as well as uh, support funding for um, uh, ancillary projects such as uh, we recently got approval to add an additional module to our um, off-site storage and the reason for that was that the library environment comments and findings all indicated that we needed to start devoting more room for user uh, study as opposed to a collection housing and uh, taking that argument to the powers that be we were able to get the money to uh, build that extra module which in, uh, in return will enable us to get a 
more uh, space available within our main libraries to uh, provide better studying facilities. Um, I do want Michael. to mention one. Yes, ma'am. Do you have an estimate of the percent of the collection that's now in the remote uh, storage? Um, no, I don't. Um, the last time we checked, we were just gearing up last year, and within uh, 60, uh, I'm sorry, within six months of opening up the facility, we had already reached our goal, which um, oh, I want to say was in the hundreds of thousands of books. Mm -hmm. But as far as the percentage of the collection, I'm not quite sure yet. I will know that by the end of this year because it's one thing that we've um, built into our accreditation effort. And, and again, it's going to be one of those cases where we have the live call comments and live call findings to indicate why this is a priority and why we needed the funding, and then to be able to demonstrate what we did with that funding and how we alleviated those user concerns. Um, I w do want to do one more uh, comment. I want to talk about the Climate Call survey. I know we're talking about live call, but Climate Call um, was an incredible survey done to talk about work climate. Uh, within the libraries. We've conducted that twice and uh, have used those findings extensively to create a, a friendlier and hopefully more positive work environment uh, for our employees, which in turn is um, you know, hopefully translating into better customer treatment. And with that, um, I'm not sure if I hit my um, 15 minutes or have exceeded it, but um, that's it. Um, thank you very much. Any comments or questions? Thank you, Michael. Uh, just a closing question on the accreditation. Uh, uh, what are some of the trends you, you, you are seeing highlighting in the accrediting reports uh, beyond the fact that you show evidence that uh, uh, you know, you're acting on feedback and improving? Um, I don't quite understand the question. Could you? I was wondering if there are certain um, trends that um, um, are, are um, you are seeing uh, being highlighted in the accreditation reports from um, whether it's in relation to, for example, the print materials that faculty are, are, you know, we're meeting their desired expectations at this point. Are there any other trends like that that uh, you see being highlighted in the accrediting report? Um, one of the biggest um, in this next round of accreditation that we're going to be doing is going to be talking about uh, uh, facilities usage. Um, um, mm -hmm. We've talked in particular about per square footage cost, and what we're doing is translating, you know, by moving X amount of volumes from our main libraries into our uh, off-site storage facilities. We freed up this, and this this has become a study area, and compare the cost of this renovation project versus if we had to build a new facility. I believe as it was said at midwinter, someone said that. They will never build a new library facility in their professional lifetime, but they do need to prepare for um, uh, the, the next dean or the dean after that that will have to start building new, uh, new buildings. And I'm seeing that trend, uh, especially with a couple of uh, other universities, um, where now we're talking not, out, not only about the administration of the existing leadership, but you know, what, what plans do we have out there you know, beyond five years in terms of facilities. Uh, customer service is, is, is always a big issue, but it's the job issue, um, the job expertise issue that's also another trend. Yeah, there's a couple of accrediting agencies, both regional and, and programmatic accrediting agencies that have actually dropped uh, library uh, requirements. Um, and so we're finding ourselves in a situation where, you know, if, if we're going to want to make sure that our voice is heard with in the accreditation process and therefore heard by our administration as a priority, then we have to go beyond just looking for those specific mentions of the library and take what we do um, and uh, demonstrate how it supports uh, learning outcomes and uh, other ad administrative priorities at the time. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing all this rich experience that you have built over the years. Uh, at Texas A&M. Uh, thank you to our audience. The um, presentation will be captured and will be available on YouTube. And Michael is available at the email uh, you see on your slide, maciel.tamu.edu. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.